Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. As you can see, we have a choir joining us tonight, so I'll try to keep my remarks brief. Our guest, George Lakey, has been active in grassroots campaigns for social change for more than seven decades. A sociologist and Quaker organizer, he was first arrested at a civil rights demonstration in 1963, and most recently uh, arrested just last year during a march for climate justice. He only recently retired from Swarthmore College, where he was the Eugene M. Lang Visiting Professor for Issues of Social Change. He is the author of a number of books, including Facilitating Group Learning, Strategies for Success with Diverse Learners, and How We Win, A Guide to Nonviolent Direct Action Campaigning. His many honors include the Peace Educator of the Year Award, the Paul Robeson Social Justice Award, and the Martin Luther King Peace Award. Tonight, he'll be in conversation with Varshini Prakash, the executive director and co-founder of the Sunrise Movement, a youth-led political nonprofit dedicated to stopping climate change. And she's the author of Winning the Green New Deal, Why We Must, How We Can. But before they take the stage, please join me in welcoming the Friends Select School Choir under the direction of Nathan Wadley to sing the civil rights protest anthem, We Shall Overcome. Good evening. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much to that beautiful, beautiful choir. George and I were just standing backstage listening to it. How did that feel? Very emotional. Yeah. We were holding hands. <laughs> because I was, in, you know, we sang that a million times in the Civil Rights Movement. We never did it without holding hands yeah. with somebody. And uh, usually a circle or a thousand people or, you know, a hundred thousand people. and. Uh, it was uh, it was the soul of the movement expressed in music wow. and uh, supported us to risk our lives for racial justice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Can you all hear us? No. Closer. <laughs> Closer? Yeah. 
<laughs> I had a feeling. <laughs> wow. Well, how are we all feeling tonight? Amazing. Thank you for braving the rain and, and the weather to be here tonight to celebrate George and his life and this wonderful, wonderful book. George, how are you feeling? I'm feeling very excited. It's just wonderful to be here with the home folks. In fact, I want to do a short shout out to my family, but because a bunch of my family are here. Would you raise your hands? Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, my family's here. I'm so happy about that. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I have to say, being backstage with George, and the first thing he said was, I am just so excited about everything that is happening right now. And I... I am just, that was the energy that I needed <laughs> today coming in, so thank you. Um, and uh, believe it or not, this is our first conversation ever in person together. Yes. Um, I feel deeply honored to have been asked um, to conduct this interview today. Thank you. And um, while it's our first conversation in person, I actually feel as though you have been a guide and a mentor in my life throughout my entire activism career. Wow. And I remember being 19 or 20 and my friends telling me about their professor that they had named George Lakey who took them to Appalachia where they learned about mountaintop removal and the fight against coal mining. And they got inspired to start a fossil fuel divestment campaign on their campus. And I got inv inspired to start a fossil fuel divestment campaign on my campus. And it was the first campaign that I ever ran and, and won and learned to organize. Um, I, I mean, I remember then starting Sunrise with many of those individuals. And then Sunrisers running them up in your house, <laughs> and you, you <laughs> putting them up, and I think it was your attic. <laughs> um, and my first trainings that I had when in my early 20s on facilitation and, you know, having tough conversations with each other and organizing were through Training for Change, uh, an outfit that you started as well. And so I really consider you to be kind of like a, a, a movement mentor grandpa. Oh, in a sense. Thank um, you, Varshini. <laughs> many of my mentors, you have mentored many of my mentors. Thank and you, thank you. I, w I would not be here, and I wouldn't be the organizer I am today without you. Wow. So I'll start by saying that. Wow. Wow. Um, wow. And I really, I really see this conversation as, as a celebration of your life. And you have lived such a full life of um, joy and success and sorrow and heartbreak and you know just it just drips with courage and creativity and spirit and faith and community and song and music so uh, thank you I'll just start with deep gratitude for the gift of of writing it all down and for have taken so many copious notes on your life for the last <laughs> <laughs> many decades so I guess we'll get right into it are you ready sure all right. Um, so I wanted to start, you know, we are just coming off of the midterms. And I think the intensity of the moment in American politics is on a lot of our minds. And there's been a huge backlash against so many of the gains that really you and many others won at kind of the, the beginning right. days of your organizing. And so how do you really view the acutely polarized state that we are in as Americans right now. Varshini, here I get to admit the biggest professional mistake I ever made in my life, <laughs> <laughs> which was that a dozen years ago or so, I was watching the polarization grow. My training is in sociology, and uh, that's a field where we get obsessed with how cohesive is any group mm. as compared with how split up it is, right? And so I was tracking the polarization, and I realized, uh-oh, whoa, we're in trouble. And it looks like it's going to be more and more and more. And I was worried about it, right? Mm. But at the same time, I was researching a book that ended up being called Viking Economics about the Nordic countries. And they made big breakthroughs. So they're in way better shape than the United States and have been now for, since the 20s and 30s. But what I was interested in was not only their system, why things work so well for them, mm. but also I wanted to know 
how they got there, right? So I was studying the history, and I found that in the 20s and the 30s, when they made their big breakthrough, yeah. was the period of greatest polarization wow. in modern times. And I thought, wait a minute, I've been reading polarization as this horrible thing, we have to somehow get through. And instead, for them, it was the breakthrough time. Yeah. Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland. So I thought, uh, I, I can't accept this, you know, I had to, more cases, more cases. <laughs> so I thought about the United States. Well, the, the United States in the 1930s, which is when I was born, believe it or not, in the 1930s was a period of enormous polarization, growing Nazi party. The, the Nazis filled Madison Square Garden, right? Mm. Communist Party, it was the glory period of the Communist Party. Mm. Tremendous polarization in the 1930s. Uh, uh, workers occupying entire major factories and so on. And lots of violence. Ku Klux Klan going crazy, lynching black people. Horrible in those terms. And then, nevertheless, the 30s was the period as greatest progress that mm. we made in the first half of the 20th century. Mm. Wow. So I'm, I, you know, I'm really, I'm practically on my back, but okay. Think forward, <laughs> think forward, or think forward. So how about the 1960s in the United States? Again, Ku Klux Klan riding high once again, Nazis having a rebirth, right? lots of terrible stuff going on in the right, mm. lots of violence, tremendous lot of bombing going on. And at the same time, on the left, some really wonderful stuff going on and also some really crazy stuff going on mm -hmm. in the extreme left, right? Huge, huge conflict in the 1960s. And it was the period of greatest progress that we made in the second half of the 20th century. Okay, so now I am really like, uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, I would not have liked that question you asked to be asked <laughs> me then because I would have been a total nut, right? But, but at the same time as that was, uh, as, as I was trying to come to terms with it, I was um, in England doing a book tour for that book, Viking mm -hmm. Economics. And I happened to be in the house of a metal sculptor an artist who specialized in metal. And I was wandering around his house, beautiful, beautiful sculpture on the walls and so on. And I said, man, how do you, how do you take metal? Metal doesn't want to do what I do. I don't know your luck with metal. but <laughs> How do you deal with metal and make it into gorgeous sculpture? And he said, I'll, I'll show you, come on. So I follow him out through the kitchen, into the backyard, into the studio back there. And he proudly shows me his blacksmith's forge and he says that's how I do it wow. I apprenticed to a blacksmith learned how to make the forge work because you're right metal doesn't want to do what I want it to do unless I heat it first yes. and I said thank you that's the metaphor I needed polarization is a forge it's a heating up of society and making it moldable Right? Mm. So you can either make great progress, like in the Nordics did, mm. or make some progress, substantial progress, in the 30s and 60s, like we did. Mm. Or, since the forge doesn't care what you do with it, you can make uh, horseshoes, right? I have a boy over here who knows about horseshoes. Uh, you, you can make horseshoes with a forge, or you can make junk with a forge, mm -hmm. or you can make sculpture. So the forge doesn't care, it just heats the metal. <laughs> and that's how polarization is. It doesn't care what we make of it. It just heats the society up mm -hmm. so we can do what we want to do. And it's our opportunity to make, I would argue, this is very controversial, the biggest progress that we've made in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And that's one reason I'm still alive at 85. I want to be part of this. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be part of this. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and I, 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 um, I remember this one quote that's in the book that said, I don't remember who exactly said it, but it was, water has to boil before you can cook anything. In there it. we go. There we go. <laughs> I love that. And I was like, there we ah. go. okay, that makes sense. I'm still a little scared for what's to come. I'm not going to lie. Um, I don't want to just downplay the pain, right? <laughs> yeah. Tremendous pain. Yeah. Tremendous hardship. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I guess it, it kind of brings me to this question about... Um, both the fear, but also courage. And I think it's a theme that I found myself turning to over and over and over again, in essentially every single chapter and story in the book. Um, and I'm wondering, like, can you speak to us a little bit about courage and s some of what 
the ingredients for cultivating courage were because I think we are gonna face a lot of things that are gonna make us scared. We're gonna have to take risks to engage for the first time. We're gonna have to take risks to do things that are scarier than we ever imagined before. And, and I don't know, I mean, I, how do we prepare for that? What does that look like? I'd like to read a little bit of the book on yeah. that in response to that question. Because, partly because I want the folks here to have a sense of what is the book written like, you know, yeah. like maybe it's utterly boring. <laughs> Even though Varshini makes it sound lively <laughs> up here on stage, maybe it, I'd fall asleep, you know, if I read this book. So, so I'll read a little bit of it just to give a sense of, of, of what it's like. Uh, this is from 1958, and I was 20 years old. A Quaker suggested that I go to what would be my first protest, a demonstration against the testing of nuclear bombs in the atmosphere. I was still more excited about discussions about philosophy mm. Mm, and stories from the actions of other people than I was in doing an action myself. How would I behave if we were physically attacked? Because there was polarization then too. I was scared of being hurt and also of not knowing how to respond. Nonviolently, sure, but what were the specifics of that? Go back to Russia, someone yelled <laughs> among the other catcalls and boos from passing drivers as two dozen of us walked in our circular picket line. Senator Joseph McCarthy was dead, but anti-communist crusaders continued their efforts to take back reforms of the 30s and 40s. We were picketing in front of the federal building in Philadelphia to support four remarkably brave men who were in jail in Honolulu. They had been arrested while sailing the Pacific Ocean on their way to the nuclear testing zone in the Marshall Islands. Mm -hmm. Their ship was called the Golden Rule, and they were protesting the nuclear arms race, specifically atmospheric nuclear testing, which was spreading cancer-producing strontium-90. I held a sign and walked behind a woman named Lillian Willoughby, who said her husband George was on the sailing ship's crew. I was alarmed by the angry shouts coming from the passing cars. I didn't see any police there to protect us. The others in the picket line didn't look worried, but I wanted reassurance. So I asked if we should be worried. <laughs> to my surprise, she chuckled. Well. You wouldn't want them to ignore us, would you? <laughs> that was the first of many mind-expanding remarks I would hear from Lillian Willoughby in the decades to follow. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Um, I guess something else that I was really struck by was how innovative and creative your activism was and had to be in, in many instances um, when dealing with the level of, of repression that you, that you and the movements you were a part of were up against. Can you say anything about your activist style and how you would define it? Uh, I have to admit that I cheat a little bit for my innovation because I, as often as possible, try to find out what people did in similar circumstances mm. in other movements. So for example, I've watched so many movies about the civil rights movement. Mm. And even though I was there, there was a lot I missed, you mm. know, and interviewed people and so on. So I very often go to the civil rights movement for my first, as my first, uh, you know, resource and think, what did they do in that situation? What did they do in that situation? Another thing, uh, but I also go to other movements as well. And lucky me, I got to be a sociologist and focus on social movements. And so I got, uh, and now we've created out of Swarthmore a uh, 1,400 strong database of wow. social movements. So there's all those examples. So that's one way that I tickle my innovativeness is I watch other, other people, what, they did that? What, they did that? They were up against that and they did that? And that really tickles me and like expands me. Yeah. And I, for me, innovation has to do with expansion. Mm. And that's one way to expand myself. And then once I do that, I think, okay, George, well, maybe you'll think of a new, a new thing uh, in this minute, but maybe it'll be a, an old thing slightly turned. Mm. And uh, either way, uh, I love to think up new things, but I also am, am inspired to create by knowing what others have done. Yeah, I love that. Actually, a funny, um, or a way that, 
my story is a little related to that, is that someone picked a, um, an example of, I believe it was the South African apartheid divestment campaign at Columbia that happened in the 70s that they took from that database. And they shared it with my divestment campaign when I was a student. And I said, we're going to do that. We're going to do that. <laughs> and two years later, we got like 34 people arrested on my campus, and 1,000 people participated in a week-long sit-in, and we divested the university a month later. <laughs> and so like, those stories matter. Those examples matter. And I don't think without, I don't think without having seen or heard or been inspired by these other movements and, and the work of just capturing them and sharing them down to future generations, just knowing that people have had that kind of wisdom, creativity, courage before allows for you to take that kind of action. And so, I, yeah, thank you for oh, that. Oh, I'm so tickled. I'm so tickled. First time I heard, knew where this Harvard amaz amazing stuff came from. Yeah. And it was inspired partly by the database. The database, by the way, is online. So you can just look up Swarthmore or look up, uh, uh, what is it called, Global Nirvana Action Database. Nirvana Action Database. Just look it up on, online and you'll find it full of amazing stories. Yeah. And that's also a part of the courage ingredient. Yeah. Like, if others can face that, mm. why can't I? Mm. Right? Yeah. And others, I mean, those, those cases are full. Well, and against the civil rights movement, full of cases of people going up against situations, you know, Ku Klux Klan, people with police uniforms on during the day and robes on at night. Mm. You know. And, and, and living through that. So that's another source of courage. Sorry? Oh, so that's another source of courage, is to go to uh, previous cases where people showed a lot of courage. Yeah. I, um, I'm struck by this one quote that I heard as well in the book that said, um, I think it was sort of on, on something similar to this, and, and your wife at the time said, getting trained sure beats walking around in fear. That's right. And I loved that. <laughs> um, and, and I'm curious, you know, what, one of the ways that you've influenced movements a lot has been through your training. There was, you know, nonviolence workshops for ACT UP or, you know, training climate activists or whatever it was. Um, do you have examples or can you share more about your training style and, and how, how your particular values and politics come through in your training style? I was so fortunate. A good friend of mine, John Lapham, said, you need a rest. <laughs> because I was very close to burnout yeah. at one point in my life, right? And he said, I will, uh, with the help of others, gather money together to give you a sabbatical and do whatever you want. Okay, well, one of the things I was curious to do during my sabbatical was find out what other people do in training, because mm. I knew what movement people did, and I did it all the time. But I wanted to know, what do other people in other sectors of society do for training? Mm. So one of the ways I used the sabbatical year that Johnny gave me was to um, go to these different trainings, some of which were off the wall, frankly, <laughs> but, <laughs> but some of which were really, really powerful, but were only available to, like, um, uh, executive class of corporations oh, and stuff, yeah. you know, like mm -hmm. the really kind of uh, very expensive stuff. Well, I'm willing to be a kind of, uh, you know, pirate in a way. <laughs> if I see people doing great stuff somewhere else, you know, and even if uh, they, they like to think, well, it's theirs and nobody should do it, I think a little borrowing now and then is all right. And so <laughs> I, I, did some, I did some borrowing, you know. And, and so thanks to that and then some additional reading and so on that I did in, uh, in Gestalt and other kinds of psychology, I put together a, a new form of training, and that's what we started Training for Change with. And it, was, it moved training, as you said, to a whole new level yeah. of, of power. We're able to get way more done in a training workshop. It's well, very exciting. Now you know how George did so much in this life because this is what he does on his breaks. <laughs> 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 oh <my laughs> I would love to get, I mean, if anybody wants to pay me for a year to just go, <laughs> go to corporate trainings and steal their ideas, I'm all for it. <laughs> but it was fun. It, was it sounds fun. really I'm, fun. I'm getting kicked out. <laughs> no, that sounds awesome. Um, I, <laughs> it's 
great. Um, you know, I, I think through all of this, we've talked about fear and courage, and there are a lot of moments in the book that are, you know, you, you faced violence and you faced the real raw pain of injustice in the world. Um, but there are a lot of light, beautiful moments as well. And could you give us just an example of one of those? Oh, I'd love to read, uh, as I warned you, I would want to. <laughs> yeah, go for it. A, a, a bit that responds to that, that question. This is about my son, Peter, uh, at age six. I found myself wanting six-year-old Peter to try his hand at activism. You see, I got such a late start, right? I was, what, 1920? And, I mean, why not start at six, right? Uh, some friends were helping out in the growing consumer boycotts of grapes and lettuce that had been called by the United Farm Workers of, in California. And they told me that they were going to start picketing at our neighborhood supermarket. I explained to Peter that the aim of the boycott that we were doing of, of uh, fruits and so on that were were being uh, picked by folks that weren't allowed to have a union, uh, the, the aim of the boycott was to improve the lives of children like, them, like himself. He immediately volunteered for the picket line. <laughs> this is a good sign. <laughs> After standing with the rest of us, holding his sign while people went in and out of the store, he got a little bored. He handed the sign to me and moved up the sidewalk about 15 feet from the supermarket door to meet people who were coming to shop. He walked up to somebody and said, don't go in there and buy that scabbage lettuce. <laughs> I guess Peter had heard us talking about scabs, who are strike breakers, who were being hired by employers. Scabbage lettuce. I saw this shopper hesitate while looking at my boy. With a look of puzzlement on her face, she then continued walking toward the door. Peter, cute as anything, with a head full of curls and a determined look, backed up in front of her as she kept walking, <laughs> saying in his biggest voice, Don't you buy that scabbage lettuce! <laughs> she kept walking, and Peter kept backing up in front of her until he backed right through the doorway and into the store. He disappeared from sight for a minute, then came out of the store and walked down the sidewalk to find another shopper to confront. He did the same thing again, walking backward in front of them while saying with a loud little boy's voice, don't you buy that scabbage lettuce. The third time he did it, he didn't come right out of the store. And I started to think I'd better go in and find out what's happening inside. But hardly a minute later, the store manager came outside, pulling Peter by the hand. The manager looked mad. <laughs> Whose boy is this? He demanded. I raised my hand proudly. He's mine. <laughs> the, the, the outcome, the United States, Farm Workers of America won that boycott. They increased wages and benefits for their workers and gained recognition as a union. Years later, when I ended up leading some nonviolent workshops with Cesar Chavez, who was the founder and, and director of UFW, I couldn't resist telling him the scabbage story. I'll never forget his appreciative grin. <laughs> I love, I love that story. I will never forget scabbage lettuce. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and I think it also points, you know, it points to this broader theme where you, you made a very deep, lifelong commitment to the fight for peace and justice and liberation. And you also committed to co-leading a family at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and can you share a little bit of perspective on, yeah, what was that like? And are there any stories that come to mind from the book or otherwise about what it meant to be holding both of those things at the same time and with so much determination and love? Oh, it was so hard. It's, uh, it, it was really, really hard. And uh, I tell in the book a lot about the inner process that I engaged in. Yeah, it, I, I was saying how hard it was 
to combine the commitment that I made at age 19. I felt called at mm. 19. You're, th this was my life, social activism for peace and justice. And at the same time, I wanted to be a family man. I wanted mm. to be, be married and have a family. And uh, I found again and again, those two were conflicting with each other, as you said. And so how to resolve that. And a lot of the, the through line of the book is how at, at different times in different uh, moments, uh, Barrett and I and the family uh, dealt with that question mm -hmm. uh, about how to maximizing at one point, um, Barrett and I traded roles, for example. So she became the primary person out in the world, moving in and shaking things while I was the primary parent at home. And so, so we tried different experiments, again, the innovation thing. Uh, to try to find some way that we could maximize, at least as a family unit, maximize the input into the larger picture so that, the, so that my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren would have a future that, you know, that, that, that had some hope, and at the same time uh, not to just do ourselves in. Yeah. So a lot, of the, a lot of the narrative of the whole book uh, has to do with that. It also struck me that so much your family wasn't just your immediate family. You had such a community that you had cultivated and built that was so included and was so far beyond your immediate family. And I, I think about the story about your, your, your battle and your, your campaign against cancer and um, just the level that of, of commitment, dedication, love, like your unit was so much larger and so yeah, can you, was that a conscious choice for you? Something that happened along the way? Like, how did you decide what family was and what it meant to you, and how how did that connect also to the fight for for justice and peace? Well, the '60s was, as I had mentioned earlier, a very polarized time with constant urgency: do this, do that, yeah. do this, do that. And we had a family, yeah. so it got more and more and more difficult. Fortunately, a lot of people were feeling that difficulty and created a community called Movement for New Society, mm. which was a way for people to work together in order to, because there's some things that are, when done collectively, are done more efficiently mm -hmm. and actually free up parents. Mm -hmm. And living in a group, for example, we lived in a group house with some pe other people who are here and now, for example, and, uh, and sharing childcare with trusted people that you live with under the same roof is a great, it's more resource for the youngsters, um, and it's also more, um, uh, and, and, it, and it, it frees, the parents at the same time. Mm. So it's a kind of win-win to look for collective solutions where the individual solutions don't work. Yeah. Could you also perhaps answer the question, should I have kids? I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> If anyone wants to talk to me about that, I'm, I'm available. No, I can tell that was a real question. No, I, know, I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> we'll take a poll after. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. We'll take a vote by consensus. <laughs> Great. Um, <laughs> so uh, you are 85. And that is correct. Yes. Sorry? You're 85, I'm yes? 85. Okay, yes, great. I really am. And, and the book, <laughs> I just want to make sure I got it right. <laughs> and, and the book shows a lot, I think, about what also keeps you going. I mean, you have, yes, 19 or 20 may seem a little old, but I mean, 19 to 20 to 85, that is decades of seeing some difficult things and being in that fight for a long time. What, I mean, what has sustained you? What has kept you going? What feeds you? What allows for you to expend so much energy and emotion and passion on, on, on this project of building a more just world? You referred earlier to community, and that's a big part of it, right? Yeah. Like, there was a time when I was ready to give up, and I was expected to die, actually, of cancer. Yeah. And it was community 
that really saw me through that, not to say medicine had no role, it did have an important role, but it was the community that made it, I was expected to die, obviously I didn't. And community was really, really, really important uh, to, to making that possible. So over and over and over, these days now, when we're feeling so anxious about the polarization, I keep urging people, so get closer to other mm -hmm. people. Get closer, mm. get closer. Has anybody here see, ever seen young children, if they're suddenly in a situation, say thunder is suddenly clapping loud or something scary, the, the hand automatically goes out from a young child, mm. right? It's just automatic. Hey, this is scary, let's face this mm. together. And, but sometimes, especially those of us who've been brought up um, Professional middle class tend to be very individualistic. Mm. There's a tendency, oh, I guess I should all somehow, you know, toughen. No, it's okay to be with other people, and it's okay to, uh, you know, to find that support with others. So that's a big, big part of it for me. Yeah. And another thing about being close to other people is that the the we we uh, we will have conflicts when when we're together, right? And we will also have new uh, understandings of what's possible when we're with other people, and sometimes that spot that opens the way to a deeper spiritual connection, mm. and that's been hugely important to me, mm. hugely important. And uh, the, uh, through the cancer struggle, for example, I got way, way, way closer to my spiritual life. Mm. So that, uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's that combination, and each you know each of us will will figure out that combination in different ways. But again, I, I suggest try this, try that, try this, try that. So we end up being closer to each other, but also closer to ourselves at the same time. Um, I don't know about you, but I carry a lot of bullshit around. <laughs> You know, I inherited some of it from my family and my community, my, my town. And, you know, this society pours bullshit on us all the time. And it's just, it's just really, you know, I, we're kind of, I want to put on wading boots sometimes before I go out in the morning. And uh, so, so to, to even be in shape, you know, to go, 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 which I'm very keen to do, uh, we, need, we need each other and we need fully ourselves. We need our spirits. We need God. Thank you. And the other piece, I mean, you start a book about organizing and activism in your life really talking about music. And can you talk a little bit about what music and song has brought to you and how that has supported you resilience-wise or just what it's meant in your life? I was so fortunate to grow up with a family that loved music. And uh, they gave me piano lessons when I was a boy. And I, it was just um, an expectation. Mm. Uh, almost anything you need to face in life goes better with music. <laughs> and there's a song for practically everything <laughs> in life, too. It's and so, so just uh, stay awake and sing or make, and, you, know, bang, you know, bang your foot or do whatever it is that you do. Yeah. Um, and so there's a film documentary being made. In fact, tonight is part of it. And uh, one of the things they wanted was for me to push the piano out on the back deck of my house in West Philly and invite friends to come and sing together. And we sang Broadway songs for a couple Aww. of hours while the film crew was, you know, taking close-ups of my fingers or whatever. Um, <laughs> it was a little weird, but, it, but on the other hand, you know, it, it, the sun the sun came out. Wow, yeah, beautiful. The sun came out. Oh, well, that's it for my portion of the interview, and I think we're now going to take some questions from the audience. So thank you, George. Thank um, you. <laughs> which, of your, which of your children is your favorite? But I'm going to ask it anyway. Which uh, of my children is my favorite? <laughs> like, no, 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 that's not the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you're not raising that question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so uh, of, of the campaigns you've done, which one has been sort of most successful in, the way that, in a way that surprised you the most? So the biggest success that's, you know, in how it surprised you. So the campaign that... In other words, you know, maybe, maybe the, uh, 
The naysayers were saying, no way this will ever happen. And it did in a relatively short period of time. Like I'm you walk into Nancy Pelosi's I'm not office hearing this and you're in the part. news, you know, that kind of thing. So kind of uh, what I'm hearing is uh, what was the campaign that surprised you or that won in a way that you didn't expect? Um, it, they asked, what's your favorite campaign? But I'm not oh, sure if you, yeah, with, with the if you want to answer that. That, that it surprised you. That it surprised you. I would say the first thought, my first thought is the campaign against apartheid in South Africa. Because the, that, the, the degree of racism in South Africa was so dug in, it was so heavily, heavily institutionalized. And at the time, this was the early 60s, really when the, camp, that inter, the international side, or mid 60s, when the international side of the campaign started really moving, I thought, no, no, no. They, they're, they're so wealthy in South Africa as compared with much of, much of Africa, and they, they've got such deep uh, roots in racism, I don't see how they mm. could give up apartheid. And um, so I, I participated in the movement. In fact, the, the Dancing with History title comes from a, a night around City Hall when there's a big mass of us protesting apartheid and the city's involvement with apartheid in those days because of its you know, investments. And um, so, and we, we danced all night. <laughs> That's where the book, the book's title comes from. We danced all night because in South Africa, the way to, what, a, a, a favorite protest form was to get lots of people out in the street and have them dance. And uh, I, I actually got later to train a, a chance to go go South Africa to do some training later on when they asked me, and I got to see some of that dancing, and it was just wow. a thrill. <laughs> yeah. So, and, but so the surprise was that uh, so many people in Britain and other countries uh, got it that this was something that needed to stop, and you know, it far away. South Africa's far away from everything, right? <laughs> Not really, but and and. Uh, but, but it matters somehow, and we'll do what we can do to stop it. Mm. And it actually, we were able to uh, end, uh, end apartheid. Uh, hey, George, it's Dwight. Good to see you. Um, I am curious. Um, you mentioned your spirituality being a part of uh, supporting you to do what you do. Um, and I'm, I'm, it's a two-part question. One is, is maybe connected to spirituality, but I'm just curious, how do you, in a world where uh, we are taught not to have a reverence for life and one another and the earth, what supports you to continue, with, continue to cultivate a reverence for life? Mm. And in terms of your own continued growth, I, I'm excited to read the book. I haven't read it yet, but I know you're someone who constantly is aware of your growing edges in ways that you're continuing to grow and evolve. And so just curious what your growing edge is now mm. here at 85. I love that. It's a great question. It's a great question. I think life is way more interesting if we do notice our growing edges and continue to push on those edges and try to grow. Uh, no matter how old we get. Life stays interesting that way. I think life would be boring, at least for me, to just sit back and say, well, I am as I am, that's it, period, boom. And so uh, one, one way that's guaranteed to take you to the edge is to do stuff that's scary. <laughs> and so uh, one reason why I started in the year 2010, Earthquaker Action Team, was because I saw a lot of uh, people who were going, pretty much going through the motions with regard to climate justice and not pushing themselves. And I thought, oh, we, we need a new organization that specializes in edgy. <laughs> specializes in edgy. So if we find out the PNC Bank is financing the blowing up of mountains for coal to destroy the future, We'll be edgy with PNC. We won't politely say, hey, would you please stop blowing up mountains? We'll go in. And it, we, were, we were a Quaker group, so we will do our Quakerism in unmistakable ways. So we would circle up in the lobby and sit down and, and, and worship 
So we were showing our spiritual base and at the same time raise tremendous trouble for the management of the bank. <laughs> Every, the customers were all paying attention to us. The tellers were all paying attention to us. I mean, it would just be it would be just crazy to try to bank with a bunch of people holding a religious service and taking up the space. Um, and we did that over and over. We ended up doing that in 13 states, what, wow. uh, 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 hundreds of actions, um, and showed that we could grow, 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 being, a, from the management's point of view, a big pain in the neck. We shut down two shareholders' meetings again, uh, doing that kind of thing by being highly disruptive. But the point was, that for, from the point, for, in terms of your question, that all of us who were doing that were in some way pushing our own edge. We were going farther than we had gone before. Now, I don't know if you've disrupted somebody else's meeting, but that, for, at least for middle class people, is something we never want to do. I mean, everybody has a right to have a meeting, like this meeting. How would we like some group to come in and disrupt it so we can't, Varsini and I can't do our thing? We'd be all very upset, right? So we thought, it's well, like let, the slogan of the you know where this is going, right? I just got, it's so funny. I mean, and and of course, and of course, the, the Quakers who had gotten bought stock in PNC Bank so that we we could compel them to let us in. <laughs> Right, we're shareholders, right? So we had the right to be there, right? So we were all over in an auditorium about this size, and um, and we were bound and determined to shut down the shareholders' meeting. And, but it was somebody else's meeting. It wasn't our meeting, really. And so uh, people were getting more and more scared, more and more scared. Like, this is really, really of offensive. And so we went to our consultant, because I urge action groups to have a consultant. I think it's excellent to have a consultant. So we went to a consultant, Daniel Hunter, and said, Daniel, we're scared. What should we do about this? And he said, oh, okay, right. So you're scared, you're getting closer to the big day, you're, getting, you're sweating a lot. How about this? He said, uh, you Quakers, you're really good at meetings, right? Oh, yes, we're very good at meetings. <laughs> oh, my God, are we good at meetings. Okay, he said, that's the answer. Just go into the shareholders meeting, Sit all over the place, scatter your forces, and then have a meeting while they're having their meeting. See how it works out. I love that. That's awesome. Just as a follow-up on that question, is there something that you feel like you're at your growing edge of at 85? Oh, it's doing this. Yeah. It's doing this. Uh, you're so perceptive. Um, because, well, you, you cheated by reading my book. Uh, it, in my book, I acknowledge that I was brought up working class by a dad who thought it was really uh, important that he teach this son who seemed so uh, inclined to drama, <laughs> so inclined to put himself forward, to teach his son to be able to keep in his place. Because if there's anything working class people should do, it's keep in their place. It's middle class people's job to shine and so on. And owning class people's job to dispense and control. But it's working class people's job to do what's given them to do. Mm -hmm. And I didn't seem to be willing to, you know, content to that. So my dad really, really, really tried to get me to knuckle under and be a good working class boy. And, uh, and while I obviously have not succeeded, uh, or he didn't succeed in, in getting me to do that. On the other hand, he still lives within me because it was such a vital issue. Now, I for a long time wondered, why is this so important to him? Do all working class dads to put their sons through this? Or is this my dad? And then I found out, he told a story one night, he was very relaxed. He was telling about the history of my town, my, my town, Bangor. And he said, you know, uh, uh, the, my very first job, my very first job, I was working in this factory, and the uh, uh, and a union, organi two union organizers, were sent to try to form a union in our factory, and they came in pretending to be regular workers, right? But they were talking and talking and talking to people, and the uh, the management found out, and so the management fired those two workers, those organizers. 
and put on the roof of the factory facing the big yard where we, where we would gather before we went in to work in the morning, facing that, a machine gun. Signal, right? He did not want his son to die. Hmm. That's what he didn't want. So he was on my side. But I kept experiencing it, you know, as, oh, you're shutting yeah. me down, you're shutting me down. And uh, so that was, that's a lifelong struggle. And uh, as Varshini knows, uh, that was, uh, that's here tonight. That is, uh, there's a part of me saying, my dad doesn't want me to be in the library system started by Benjamin Franklin in <laughs> the city that I'm proud to call my city. Uh, it, uh, my dad doesn't want all these good, smart people to be paying attention to me in this way. And I'm up here sweating, and I w I've been sweating all day. Um, and that's okay. That is, it's not comfort. That's a goal. Hmm. I like pleasure. <laughs> comfort is not my goal. I'm okay to be uncomfortable for the sake of growth. I'm told that people who care about physical exercise have that attitude also, right? Right? You don't go into physical exercise in order to be comfortable. <laughs> right? That's not the goal. Or you don't try to be an athlete on the high school team if comfort is your goal. Mm -hmm. Right? So I know what I want to do with my life. I know what it's my role to do in life. It's my mission. It's my ministry to do that in my life. And I will be frequently uncomfortable because my dad will be saying, no, that's not okay. And hey, dad, I'm doing my thing. Mm. Well, I think we can take one more. I love this theme of, uh, of you pushing to your comfort zone. And uh, having had the experience of watching you put other people out in, in uncomfortable places, <laughs> I wonder if you have some stories about, um, about teaching uh, and about, you know, the way you um, push students at UPenn and Swarthmore and other places uh, to, in the speak outs that you did on corners and stuff like that. Um, that was really exciting kind of stuff you did. Two stories immediately come to me. One is at Swarthmore College, a student of mine came stomping into my office and saying, you gave me a B. I have never had a B in my life. <laughs> this is a student who always had A's, right? And I looked at him and I said, Congratulations, about time. <laughs> Second story that occurs to me is uh, at, I taught for quite a while at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, and did I ever get some ire from some of my colleagues uh, because I was taking my class, once uh, each semester's class <laughs> got this baptism of fire. We would come down to City Hall with a crate, a milk crate, and they would take turns getting up on the crate and speaking to passers-by, you know, at, at, uh, usually at 4 p.m. or so, commuter time, as people were walking by and try to get people's attention to the issues of the day, whatever it was that the student wanted to talk about. And pe pe the students <laughs> universally felt I was putting them through hell. I mean, it was just like this horrible, horrible, horrible experience. Um, and afterward, they felt like they could move mountains. You know, I mean, they said, "Oh my God, I did this! I did this horrible thing!" And I actually did it. Um, but I got such negative feedback from a couple of my colleagues at Penn. They went to the chair of the department and they said, "George is doing this," and he, they described it. And they said. An Ivy League university. <laughs> you can picture, I bet there are Harvard professors who say the same thing. Ivy League university doing this with students. It's outrageous. Well, I went to UMass. What's that? I went to UMass, to be clear. University of Massachusetts. Oh, I thought you were Harvard. I did not go to Harvard. Nope. <laughs> oh, I'm immediately more relaxed with you. <laughs> Just to make it very clear. 
But I would love to take Harvard students out and put them on a box. I would love to do that. I can hardly wait. Maybe this will be the year. I'm still waiting. <laughs> but it, it, it was a marvelously expanding thing for them. And Oh, and you know what the head of the department said to these irate uh, colleagues of mine? The, uh, the head of the department said, you know what? Different subjects use different methodologies. <laughs> so, for example, some, some professors will have people working with beakers, you know, in, la uh, you know, in the lab with Bunsen burners and stuff like that, while uh, a, a French professor will have people speaking French to each other, and <laughs> geographers will have you, and, and a botanist will have people out in the meadows looking at flowers. So I don't happen to think that everybody has to teach in the same way. And uh, this is George's way of teaching. It's okay with me. <laughs> well, I think we're just about at time here. Um, and I think before we officially close, I just wanted to, um, <clears throat> if I can, on behalf of my generation, just say thank you um, from the bottom of my heart. The, the things that you have risked your life for, that you have committed to and fought for and won and lost and fought again, um, those justices and transformations and steps forward are why I get to live the life that I get to live today, and many of us do as well. And um, <clears throat> I, I just really, um, as part of the generation that's going to be really, that is already and will be taking responsibility for this world, uh, I received that and I accept it and I hope that we can do you proud. And thank you. <laughs>